Hey, deserving listeners, I thought I would answer patron emails. This first one is about the concept of overfunctioner versus underfunctioner. This is a Bowenian therapy concept, family systems therapy concept that I often talk about. And they, in the email, say, I'm really interested in your overfunctioner, underfunctioner dynamic, in the un- overfunctioner, underfunctioner dynamic, dynamic. Those parts really stick out to me in your videos when you talk about it. In your career, have you seen if the overfunctioner, underfunctioner relationship, can they work? Is it common? Is it unhealthy by nature? Is there a way to work through this? Okay, so let's go in, end of email. Let's go into it here. So the way that I can describe it is that all couples have a dilemma. They want closeness, they want warmth, they want love, but they also want their independence. They want to voice their own ideas even when it's in opposition to what their spouse is saying. And so sometimes these two forces are in conflict. And this is the central conflict that is at the, the foundation of Bowenian theory, that we, we want to be close, but we also want to be separate at times. And so when things are going well, then we will flexibly move between those two forces of merging with other people when we're in love and separating from people when there's tension and when we want to think for ourselves. So let me give an example. So parents with children, they will often conflict about how to raise their kids. And so each parent might have a different idea about what to do. And so on one hand, they want to be close and they want to parent together and they want to see things eye to eye. But if they disagree, then they also want to be able to express their own ideas about parenting and maybe win the argument. So they want love, they want to merge, they want to be on the same page. But on the other hand, they also want to assert their own beliefs about parenting for one reason or another. And so one solution to deal with this conflict is, so, so let me back up. So there's a lot of ways to deal with this conflict and every, every set of parents runs into this. So what do you do? Well, in the healthy sense, the best way to deal with it is to be assertive, meaning that you assert your own wants. My, my cat wants to chime in. Um, I don't know if it's just like I turn on the microphone and suddenly my cat thinks I'm talking to her. Um, but anyway, getting back, back to this. So, so there's a lot of solutions to that conflict that parents will run into. The one optimal way to deal with it is to hear your spouse and really try to take it in, really try to understand them, and then hold on to your own wants and desires, and then try to figure out what to do. Maybe they should, maybe your partner should win, maybe you should win, maybe there should be a compromise, maybe there's a third option. And you assert your wants, but you don't freak out that there's a conflict, and you don't freak out that the other person doesn't really like your opinion, and your partner doesn't freak out when you don't really agree with them. You're just, you're okay with with the tension of that. That's, and, and in that moment when there's the tension, a differentiated person can separate themselves and say like, okay, in this moment, we're not gonna see eye to eye, and that's okay. I don't have to merge with this person. You know what? I love this person, and we merge in a lot of great ways, but in this moment, man, do we see things differently? And that's okay. It doesn't mean it's the end of the relationship. For undifferentiated people, this tension is overwhelming, and they will resort to some other solution that is less than healthy. And one of those less than healthy options is to bifurcate your roles into an overfunctioner, underfunctioner. Basically, the overfunctioner is the person who is the competent one, the strong one, the independent one, and the underfunctioner is the weak one, the incompetent one, the stupid one, or the silly one, or the childish one, or the the person who suffers from an illness or something like that. And so, a one so as as these parents head into this conflict in the beginning of their relationship they might slowly develop into these bifurcated roles over time uh, meaning that one person slowly becomes more and more the overfunctioner and the underfunctioner slowly becomes more and more the underfunctioner we call this a complementary relationships complementary relationship because it complements each other 
And there's nothing wrong with a complementary relationship. It's it's only it only becomes a problem if it is a problem, if that makes sense. And usually it's a problem when they're rigid, meaning that they don't respond to efforts to change it, that they, they don't have flexibility. For example, there's nothing wrong with one person being an overfunctioner. You know, let's say like for me and my wife, like she's, you know, sorry to stereotype or to play the stereotype, but she's better in the kitchen than I am. I'm just not a very good cook. And so when we might be making a meal together, uh, she overfunctions and she'll be in control more than I am. And I'm the one who listens. I'm the one who doesn't know what I'm doing. And she she might kind of bark at me a little bit, like you're doing it wrong. And then I'll be like, oh, okay, I'm doing it wrong. And, and then I'll do it a different way. And so this all is uh, okay as long as that isn't the overall look of our relationship, that it's just in that context that she overfunctions and I underfunction. So compl- complementarity is fine. It's normal in relationships. The problem is, is if it becomes generalized and rigid and unflexible to the entire relationship system. And usually what determines if someone's going to be an overfunctioner or underfunctioner is their roles that they had while they were growing up. So in, in their family of origin, if they were parentified, which I'll go into in a bit, then they tend to be more overfunctioning. And if you were made to be the stupid one in your family or the incompetent one in your family, then you're more prone to be the underfunctioner in a dyad in a relationship. So now, oftentimes when they talk about overfunction or underfunctioner, they don't really go into detail about how exactly these things develop. And so I want to talk about that a little bit. Most things in systems develop very slowly over time, and you can almost kind of consider it a behavioral uh, uh, theory um, cause, meaning that through trial and error, people learn what tends to be the best option that they can find available to them. So for example, let's say that you have a couple and they're in the beginning of the relationship, and one person you know, has a slight overfunctioning tendency, and the other person has a slight underfunctioning tendency. But they haven't really solidified into a, a rigid bifurcation of the roles yet, meaning that the underfunctioner sometimes overfunctions and, and vice versa. And so let's say they have a fight about something. It's a big fight, and there's a lot of tension, and there's a lot of uncertainty about the relationship. The two people are like, oh, my God, is this the end of our relationship, or is this the way it's always going to look? It's very scary. And let's also say that they lack differentiation, meaning that they weren't raised very well in a nutshell, and they are overwhelmed with these fears of the relationship ending, and they have a hard time holding on to their rational thought. And so there's just a lot of swirl of emotion, a lot of fear, and just a lot of difficulty. And in that moment, since the overfunctioner has a slight tendency to overfunction, let's say that the overfunctioner, you know, takes over in that moment. There, there's tension, there's conflict, and the overfunctioner steps forward and says, you know what, I got this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this is what we're going to do, and um, we're going to do it this way, and and then that will end the conflict. And then the underfunctioner is like, okay, good. Somewhat, you know, the, the overfunctioner is taking care of it, and I don't. And the, if if I allow the overfunctioner to take over, then the tension will be over. And that's what they do. The overfunctioner takes over. The underfunctioner follows, and immediately the tension goes down. Well. If you rinse and repeat this over and over and over again, it starts to solidify a pattern. It makes a routine. It makes a, a, a habit of this system. And this is somewhat subconscious. You know, the overfunction or underfunction or di- dynamics aren't usually developed in a conscious manner. It's, it's just in an unconscious manner, meaning that you, you sort of trial and error with various different behaviors, and you find that some behaviors lead to low retention. And so you just have this automatic response of, of doing that behavior. And over time, what happens is the overfunctioner becomes the overfunctioner almost all the time. And the underfunctioner becomes the underfunctioner almost all the time. And the people will believe that they are overfunctioning, meaning that the overfunctioner, even though in the beginning they were more similar or just had slight differences, uh, you know, you, you do this for 10, 20 years. The overfunctioner will believe that they are very strong and that they're very capable and that they're better than the underfunctioner. And the underfunctioner will believe that they're incapable, they're incompetent, 
They don't know how to make decisions on their own. And that was all developed through a relational process between these two undifferentiated people. And it's hard to untangle that, right? So uh, it w now, to be clear, people don't do this maliciously. They're doing it because it, it was the best solution that they had available to them at the time. If they had a different solution, like, like a therapist who actually helped them to remain differentiated during that process, then they would have developed perhaps a different routine that wasn't the uh, over-functioner, under-functioner. So this is something that's, that slowly develops in, uh, in the, the absence of another solution that could have gone better. And, it, to another th and by definition, the over-functioner, under-functioner dynamic does provide uh, a benefit. It looks very dysfunctional, like why would you do this? But there's a benefit to it. Why would two people engage in that if there wasn't a benefit? So the benefits are that that closeness is preserved and that there's lower anxiety and tension. So with the overfunction or under, the, the way to look at a lot of weird family dynamics is that that might look from the outside like, why do, why do people do this sort of thing? Well, often the family system subconsciously or even consciously believes that there's no better way. This is the only way that we are going to preserve closeness. So the, the sort of subconscious thought process is if, if the overfunctioner doesn't take over and if the underfunctioner doesn't allow the overfunctioner to take over, then we are going to fight and it's going to break us up and then we will and we'll, we'll be alone and we won't have any kind of closeness and we won't have any warmth and we won't we'll, we'll be isolated and sad and depressed so at least we have closeness because remember attachment is one of the primary drives of humans and so we'll do a lot to preserve that even participate in what can be very you know pr problematic dynamics so that's a pro, to, that's you know, the pros and cons, that's a pro to this dynamic. The con is that it's not as optimal as it could be and it's not as close as it could be. And both people are usually suffering. But it's a deal with the devil. They're like, well, I, I'd rather be close and deal with this weird dynamic than be alone. Now, from the outside, you might say, well, couldn't they just find someone else? That's not usually how we feel on the inside. We usually feel like, well, what if I never meet anyone else? Or what if I meet someone else and it's worse? These kinds of things. So there's pros and cons to each role too. So the overfunction or the pro is that they get to make decisions and they get to be, they get to feel competent, even though they're not necessarily competent. The con to be the overfunctioner is that they're alone and they don't get any help from anyone. And they always have to be the responsible one. And they might resent the underfunctioner for not pulling their weight. The underfunctioner, pros and cons, the pros are is that they don't have to make decisions. They, they can sit back and relax and be chill, and someone else will always take care of it. That's a wonderful position to be in. <laughs> the cons are that the person has to sacrifice their self-esteem because it gets under their skin. They actually believe that they're incompetent. And they also uh, will resent being discounted a lot secretly. So let's get into some of the qualities of the overfunctioner, underfunctioner. So the overfunctioner will be over-responsible. They might seem independent and strong. They might feel as though the underfunctioner is incapable. So you'll, you'll hear a lot of overfunctioner, underfunctional relationships where the overfunctioner will just be like, my husband, he is lazy, he procrastinates, or my wife She's always hysterical. She's always sick. She always is overwhelmed. And I'm always the one who has to do everything. And whenever I do give my spouse a job, they always screw it up or they often screw it up. So, you know, so, you know it's just better I do it on my own. The overfunctioner usually talks a lot instead of listens. They often give a lot of advice, whether it's wanted or not. The overfunctioner often worries about the underfunctioner. There's a lot of one directional worry. The underfunctioner doesn't usually worry about the overfunctioner, but the reverse is true. So they might, uh, the overfunctioner might worry, oh, my spouse, you know, how are they going to uh, get uh, you know, away from substance abuse? Or 
how are, how is my spouse going to get a job or how is my spouse going to feel when we hang out with my family because the underfunctioner gets really shy or something like that. So there's a lot of worry from the overfunctioner, a lot of concern. There's a lot of focus. The the overfunctioner is very focused on the underfunctioner. The overfunctioner will feel responsible for the underfunctioner. The overfunctioner often has goals for the underfunctioner, meaning that the overfunctioner will often say things like, "Well, yeah, I'm trying to get I'm trying to get him to work out more, or I'm trying to get her to go back to school to get a job that's better, or I'm trying to get him to quit his job because his job is so bad, or I'm trying to get her to stop drinking or stop smoking pot so much, or." I'm trying to get him to go to therapy, you know. So these are all th- things that uh, are goals that the overfunctioner has for the underfunctioner. And the last thing here is that overfunctioners they'll they they'll they will periodically burn out because they dislike always being the responsible one. When things are going relatively stable and well, they're, they're fine. In fact, they want to be a, they want to be responsible. They want to be the one who does everything. But every once in a while, it just comes to a head and the overfunctioner is like, why, why do I always have to do everything? And they'll get burnt out. So that's the overfunctioner. The underfunctioner will act incapable. And, rem- and I use that word act intentionally, that underfunctioners will feel incapable and incompetent. They'll look incompetent. Everyone will think they're incompetent. They'll be treated like they're incompetent, but they're not actually incompetent. They're only doing that to fulfill a role. Underfunctioners will seem dependent and or weak. They will ask for advice a lot. They will act irresponsibly. They will listen a lot rather than talking, whether or not they're actually listening, but they'll, they'll tend not to talk as much. Not always, but that's just a tendency. They, the underfunctioner might lack goals because they don't believe that they can actually achieve them. They might resent the, their underfunctioner status and the way that they're treated, but they might hide it. They might be passive aggressive about this resentment. And the underfunctioner will often be symptomatic, meaning they're the depressed one, they're the anxious one, they're the addicted one, they're the physically ill one. They're the one who is overwhelmed. They're the one who can't get out of bed, or they're the one who struggles the most emotionally. So the overfunction or underfunctioner fit together in this complementary way. And because they're undifferentiated, they don't really differentiate between the two people. They fuse themselves together basically in one ego. So the underfunctioner will express the negative emotions and the pessimism of the future and the sadness and the fears. The overfunctioner will express the, you know, let's, you know, let's move on. Let's get this, let's get this done. Let's not get bogged down in the emotions. And, and so they both do it for each other. The overfunctioner depends on the underfunctioner to express emotions and to express those sad emotions. And without the underfunctioner, the overfunctioner would have to express those emotions on their own. And so, so each person alleviates the other person of a job that they have anxiety about. And over time, these become more and more rigid. And so you people out there listening, you might be able to identify with some of this. There's a lot of overfunctioners who listen to this podcast, I think. And so you might have an underfunctioning spouse where for 10 years you've been dealing with that person who is incompetent, irresponsible, maybe they're a bad parent, they seem weak, they, they don't really try to better themselves. Now there's a lot of different you know, possibilities. It might not be your dynamic. It might just be that your spouse is depressed or some other thing. But often it is at least in part, if not fully due to this overfunctioner underfunctioner dynamic. And so the solution is often the overfunctioner will think the solution is, well, I just have to get the underfunctioner to be uh, more responsible and less incompetent. And although that is basically one of the major goals, 
the way the overfunctioner goes about it usually will just solidify the goal. So the overfunctioner will go to the underfunctioner and say, hey, I need you to get better at this. And then the underfunctioner feels bad about themselves. They get in a fight about it, blah, blah, blah. Just, it just keeps things the same. So usually this, the solution is couples therapy with someone who understands this dynamic, which um, I would say a good number of couples therapists do because they're usually trained in Bowenian theory. And uh, so, so the solution is that bo if both people change the way they think, feel, and act at the same time, the dynamic should change. In addition to becoming both more differentiated, meaning that they b develop a sense of self, they can tolerate tension in a relationship, they can trust that tension won't result in the relationship dissolving, they can express themselves more freely. It's a lot of things and it's hard to do. Uh, a lot of times what family, just pure family systems therapists will propose is they'll just say, well, the over, if the overfunctioner you know, refrains from overfunctioning and the underfunctioner refrains from underfunctioning, then they will both kind of meet in the middle and neither one of them will be over or underfunctioning in general. And what I find is like, yeah, certainly, you know, that's a, a, a tactic you can take. But some people come with a lot of historical personality issues that contribute to this. And so uh, those things have to be addressed in the, in the long term. A lot of schemas that have to be uh, experientially dismantled. Uh, but anyway, so without going into full detail of all the schemas and psychodynamics of personality, uh, a, a pretty solid function or a pretty solid tactic, pretty uh, good tactic to take is, so the over, so you're talking, so if I had a couple and I have in this situation, so I, I would talk to the overfunctioner, I would say, okay, so overfunctioner, do you feel kind of wary of the fact that you always have to be responsible? And the overfunctioner was, yeah, I, I'm wary of that. Okay. Underfunctioner, do you feel like you're wary of always having to give in to what the overfunctioner is saying and that y you you want to feel like you can do things without the overfunctioner look always watching you so that's that's another thing is the overfunctioner will often observe the underfunctioner a lot in a what i call a panopticon way but without going into the uh, foucault idea but essentially it's you the the underfunctioner will frequently feel observed and when, you're, when you feel observed in a critical way, meaning the overfunctioner is watching in a critical, like let's say that you, you go home and you try to experiment and the, and the overfunctioner is like, okay, you know what? I'm gonna let you parent the kids and I'm not gonna intervene because I want you to have the freedom to function as you want to. And, and so the underfunctioner is like, okay, great. I get a parent the way I want a parent and the overfunctioner won't be there uh, to tell me what to do. Well, the anxiety will be so high in the overfunctioner that they will have a really hard time not watching with a critical eye and, and not jumping in. And the underfunctioner also, and this is the key when we understand systems theory. So we, we can understand how the overfunctioner would be dominant and a jerk by imposing their will on the underfunctioner. But the key to systems theory is understanding that the underfunctioner will also suck in the overfunctioner. So let me give a possible example. So let's say that they're in therapy and we identify this, this dynamic and we decide, you know what? And parenting is a big flashpoint for these two. And we decide, okay, the underfunctioner, when you guys are going to go home from the session and the underfunctioner is going to take over parenting for the night, the underfunctioner is going to um, make all the decisions about parenting. And the under and the overfunctioner is going to be more of a support person because we're, we're trying to right the ship, if you will, we're trying to balance it out a little bit more. Um, now, I might do this just as an experiment to see what happens because systems uh, therapists will often do this. It's like, well, let's give this directive and, let's, and if it goes wrong, then we'll analyze where it went wrong and then we'll know what to fix. But anyway, so let's say they go home and the underfunctioner takes over. And for, you know, half an hour, the overfunctioner is sitting back and just observing and they're cool with it. But then something kind of weird starts to happen. One of the kids has a meltdown or there's some kind of issue. And the underfunctioner starts to flounder a little bit. The, un the underfunctioner parent is like, 
oh, you know, uh, come on, Timmy, do this. Now, it makes sense that the underfunctioner is a little overwhelmed because they've never been fully allowed to parent on their own without the overfunctioner coming in. So the underfunctioner is going to be a little incompetent just because of that, even if they're really trying to be competent. So, but how do you become more competent? Well, you practice and you are given a space to, uh, tr you know, trial and error and learn without someone constantly coming in and taking over. So the overfunctioner will have, uh, so the overfunctional might go into dominant. Now, but the underfunctioner in that moment, getting back to what I was going to get to, <laughs> is scared of screwing things up. So the overfunctioner is scared of the underfunctioner screwing up, but the underfunctioner is also scared of screwing things up. And so when that fear kicks in and they don't have a way of dealing with that, which you know, undifferentiated people have a hard time, harder time with that, then they might do like, like a scenario might be the under. So let's say the overfunctioner is really staying out of the parenting. They're just okay. I'm I'm really just gonna, you know, grit my teeth and allow the underfunctioner to parent for the kids. And then the underfunctioner starts to make some mistakes and little Timmy starts to have a meltdown. And then the overfunctioner is like, okay, I'm staying out of it. I'm going to be I'm going to be strong. I'm going to follow the therapist direction. Well, the underfunctioner at that point has a why in the road. Well, so if if they decide to continue to try to parent well, they're going down a road that they've never been down before maybe. And so that's scary. They're also going down a road of weight. So if I go down this road of independence, that means that I have to do things on my own. And that's scary because I've never done things on my own. I was always the underfunctioner in my family of origin. I, I married an overfunctioner. I've never done things on my own. And that's terrifying. I don't want to be alone. I don't know if I can do things on my own. Okay. So, or I can go continue the underfunctioning role and someone will come in and save me and then every, all that anxiety will go away. So if the under and the underfunctioner often will choose the dysfunctional route just because most people do in the beginning. And so the underfunctioner might do some might throw their hands up and storm out of the room and say like, "Well, Timmy, if you're not going to do what I say, then I give up." And the overfunctioner slams a door and runs out. Now, if they're not in therapy, the overfunctioner will say, "See, the underfunctioning parent is inherently a terrible parent, can't handle things. But a systems theorist, when we look at this, is we would say, no, the underfunctioner is capable, but the underfunctioner is scared of change. Everyone is afraid of change. The longer a family is together, the, the more they are afraid of change. Why are they? Now, we say, well, why would you be afraid of change? Well, the reason why people are afraid of change is because of that thing I was saying earlier, is that if change happens, things could get better, things could stay the same, or things could get worse. And because I'm so afraid of things getting worse, meaning that our relationship ends or it becomes even more dysfunctional or something, I, I'm going to resist change altogether. That's why we resist change, because we think, well, at least I know what I have right now. I know we have some closeness. We have some self-esteem. We have some love. I know it could be better. But if we change things, what if it got worse? That, would, that terrifies me. So the underfunctioner is faced with this parenting situation, and they're, they're scared, and they, they don't know what to do. And they will create a vacuum for the overfunctioner to come in. So if I was there in the room, which would be weird, but sometimes I would do home visits with families and the overfunctioner would sweep in and say, okay, I'm taking over. And I would say, no, 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 overfunctioner, parent, uh, continue to do your differentiation techniques, deep breathing, relax. Then I would go over to the over, over, underfunctioner. I'd say, what's going on? They'd be like, I can't do it. And I'd be like, you can do it. I know you're a good parent. You can do it. And plus... Even if you make a mistake, all parents make, make mistakes. No big deal. Uh, what's going on? Okay, well, I, I just, I don't know. I just, Timmy is just being a, a jerk face. You're like, yeah, you know, kids are jerk faces. So let's get back in there. You can do it. This is, you know, you're running into your underfunctioning uh, mentality of I'm weak. I'm, 
I can't do things, I'm incompetent, and I need other people to step in. And frankly, by storming out of the room, you're creating a situation where your spouse has to step in for you. And that's what we're trying to get away from, right? You don't like it when your spouse is constantly stepping in and undermining your parenting, right? Well, this means you have to establish a new routine, which means there's going to be growing pains and there's going to be fear and it's not going to feel quite right and there's going to be a lot of anxiety. But this is the path. So get back in there. You can do this. I know you can. Okay? The underfunctioner gets back in there, makes mistakes, calms down, differentiates, and you rinse and repeat this over and over again, and you no longer have overfunctioning, underfunctioning while preserving the closest. So while we're doing this change in parenting and other kinds of things, I'm also keeping them close. I'm also helping them to love each other through that process so that they learn that the change doesn't compromise the closeness. Okay. Does that make sense to you people? Let me know. If you're watching on YouTube, comment below because this is high level stuff. This is graduate level lectures on systems theory that frankly, a lot of family therapists don't really understand because it's really complicated. <laughs> family systems theory is a very weird way to think. And the reason why I can speak to it fairly fluidly is because I have been thinking about it, reading about it, teaching it, uh, using it with clients, using it with supervisees for 25 years, 26 years now. So, it, it, and I could say that it didn't really click until about 10 years ago, maybe seven years ago. So I was teaching this, I was teaching family systems theory and since the beginning of my career, um, 23 years ago as a, as a professor, and I probably didn't get it until 15 years into it. In fact, my very first lecture was on Bo Bowenian theory. <laughs> and uh, uh, looking back, I, I knew enough to teach it, but not enough to be able to speak to it the way I can now. And maybe in another 25 years, I'll be even better at talking about it, but anyway. Uh, let's go on to, the, so the next part of their email here uh, is a related topic, and they're saying, um, I've just listened to a bit about parentification, and I would love to hear more about it. I have been parentified by my dad, and I am an overfunctioner in my romantic relationship. My spouse has a lot of childhood traumas, and I see my partner parentify his own 10-year-old daughter with whom I empathize a lot. He's been in that dynamic with her for as long as I can remember. I don't know what to do. The only thing I found is to show her that I'm in charge and not to have that role with me. But I feel like it's not enough as I'm not around all the time and it's a very strong role that she has taken with him. If you have ways to deconstruct that role she took before reaching adulthood, I'd, like to, I'd be eager to hear it. I care deeply about my stepdaughter and I don't want her to struggle as much as I did, if not more as my own parentification was light compared to hers, end of email. So basically, you know, what we have here is that this person is married to someone and or involved with someone and uh, he, her, her partner uh, ha, has a 10-year-old daughter and the 10-year-old daughter is being parentified. So, so if we looked at the full system here, we have She's the overfunctioner, the emailer. The husband or boyfriend is the underfunctioner. And the 10 year old daughter is now also becoming an overfunctioner of sorts, being parentified by the father, meaning that the 10 year old daughter is taking care of the dad or taking over in a lot of situations or taking care of younger children or whatever the situation is. And so you'll see that. You'll see that underfunctioning partners will often parentify their children. And so this emailer is asking what to do. Well, go to a family therapist who understands this dynamic because it's really hard. I'm telling you, I, I've had, I've worked with families like this and it takes years to deconstruct. It's hard because the boyfriend, his personality has been in development since he was a young child. And you said that he's, he's had a lot of traumas. And so, you know, hit the ideas about himself are, are pretty solidified. And so it takes a long time. Uh, I've worked, it's so easy to identify these kinds of dynamics and so hard to change them. I, 
and it just takes a long time. It, it's very hard. I, I one time I ran early in my career. I learned this. I had this family where there was a lot of enmeshment and parentification of the oldest uh, son. There were three boys and a single mom, and the oldest boy was being parentified and sort of com, uh, becoming kind of a companionate, f- companionate role for the mom. Meaning that the oldest boy, even though he was like ten years old, was kind of becoming the man of the house and kind of the, a pseudo husband of sorts, not in a sexual way, of course, but in an emotional way. And I worked for a long time to assess that and then to point it out. And then the family eventually agreed after a long time. They're just like, oh, yeah, I guess, I guess we see what you've been saying for the past few months. And then I thought, okay, well, now that we know the dynamic, it shouldn't be that hard to change. I mean, the mom's fully on board. The oldest boy is fully on board. Okay, let's just change that behavior. Let's just stop it. Well, as I was talking about before, this negative feedback and the fear of change in a family system, the homeostasis of a system, is such that change becomes really, really hard for people. There's so much anxiety to changing the way a family system operates. For you people out there who are in a system, whether it's a system of a family or a work system or a friend system or a, you know, some other kind of human system, uh, think about the things that you would like to change. And th- if you're in the system long enough, you might have actually tried to change it already and found that it was really, really hard to change it. <laughs> and what, you'll, what people will often walk away with, well, it's just, you know, the other people, they don't want to change. Well, th- yeah, but even other people are probably trying to change the system too. And you're probably resisting that change in ways that you can't see very clearly. So emailer, you're asking like, you know, what can I do to help my stepdaughter and my boyfriend to to not, because I don't want this stepdaughter to be parentified. Well, and and one of the things you're doing is you're you're saying, look, 10-year-old girl, you don't have to parent, you don't have to be, you don't have to over-function her for me. And you're trying to show her that she can be a kid. And that's great. That's one thing you can do. The main thing you can do is, again, through family therapy, Get the boyfriend to not be an underfunctioner and get you not to be an overfunctioner. The fact that you're concerned about him and the daughter is evidence of overfunctioning. It's fine that you're concerned, but it shows me that the two of you have fused in a certain way and that you have taken on the thought process, the worry about the daughter, and that takes away the worry from him. Essentially, when you fuse two people, uh, and there's a worry about the daughter, one person will possess that worry while the other person doesn't. So it's that bifurcation of roles. It's like, okay, good. You worry about it and you, and then, you know, cause as the overfunctioner, the, 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 the downside is you worry a lot about the daughter, but on the pro side, you feel like you're better. You feel like you're competent. You feel like you're capable and you have more self-esteem, this sort of false self-esteem of just like, well, I'm better at this than my, than my boyfriend is. There's a huge benefit to that. And so those, those are the pros and the cons of the over-functioning. And the under-functioner, the, the con is like, I, don't, I can't do things because I'm incapable. But the, the pro is like, I don't have to worry about things because my partner will always take care of it. And so... Changing that dynamic is very hard, but it, that would be the main uh, thing that I would think, in my experience treating families like this, that would change the parentification of the 10-year-old. So uh, I hope that makes sense. Going back to your original questions here, you're asking about the, you know, can overfunction or underfunctioner relationships work? Can they work? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you got to define what work means, meaning that they stay together. Yeah, over there, there have been overfunction or underfunction or dynamics who have been married for seventy years. But is it optimal? No, it's it's not optimal because of the reasons that I've been talking about. Um, can it cause a relationship to have so much conflict that there is a breakup? Absolutely. Is it common? You ask, and I would say yes. It's it's common. It's one of the most common results of undifferentiation in relationships. Um, you know, one person is drinking all the time, the other person isn't. One person 
is very good with money. The other, you know, the other person isn't. One person is a very good parent. The other person isn't. One person is good in social situations. The other person isn't. And all the, you know, the competent roles are all in one person and the incompetent roles are in the other person. Yeah, it can be a very common dynamic. Is it unhealthy by nature? Well, I will say that mm, I, it's not optimal by nature. I don't know if unhealthy is the best word for it. It's, it's not, I mean, maybe, un, so I will say that for some, we, so we have to define sort of like best case scenario. So for some couples, best case scenario is the overfunction or underfunction or dynamic given their issues. So some couples, if we just simply said, you know, well, don't be overfunction or underfunction, and we really tried to work on it, some other problem might emerge. So it might be for a particular couple the best that they can do, which is fine. Usually it isn't, though. So I'll say that is, but but that but by definition, it, it is a dysfunctional pattern. Now let's say you had a couple, like I said, about where. I'm in the kitchen and my wife is cooking and she's she's the competent one and I'm the incompetent one. And let's say we have a number of different functions like that. Like when we're trying to find direction somewhere, my wife is the one who's really good at it and I'm bad at it. Well, if, or parenting, she's good at it, I'm bad at it. Well, if things work well enough and closeness is preserved and the function of a family is uh, addressed well enough, then the overfunction or underfunction or dynamic, we might just say like, well, yeah, it's not the best, but you know, things seem to be working pretty well. But usually that's not the case. Usually the underfunctioner will become so incompetent and the, un and the overfunctioner will become so critical of the underfunctioner that it is really noticeable that it, it's not a happy time. All right, let's go on to another email. But before that, let's get a word from our sponsor. Today's sponsor is geared towards you clinicians out there. Many of you clinicians have emailed me asking questions about how to build your practice. Well, there's a solution. It's called online therapy. It's one of the solutions. And that's where BetterHelp comes in. If you're interested in building an online practice, go to betterhelp.com slash in Seattle to get started. Make sure you use the slash in Seattle, because that's what helps us out. That's what indicates to BetterHelp that this advertisement was worth it. Research shows that people are increasingly turning to online therapy for various reasons during the lockdown, blah, blah, blah. And research also shows that online therapy can be an effective way of helping people. I have colleagues and supervisees who really love doing this sort of work. They really like the freedom that being a BetterHelp therapist provides. You get to work from home. You get to work when you want to. You get to work while on vacation. You know, you can, you can travel and still work. And, and so there's a lot of benefits that I've heard from uh, being a better help therapist. So if you're interested, it's definitely worth checking out. You know, if, if, if you're curious, I would, I would check it out, particularly if you're looking for clients. So go to betterhelp.com slash in Seattle, betterhelp.com slash in Seattle. Also, but I've been told by BetterHelp that they will take care of a lot of the business stuff for you, like getting you clients, which is a big deal, right? They also take care of your billing and your, the insurance and all that kind of stuff, which can be really annoying and a bother. So you can get back to just doing therapy. <laughs> so go to betterhelp.com slash in Seattle to get started. Okay, this next email is from upper tier patron Jasmine from Oregon. She writes, I have a dismissive avoidant attachment style, which I'm working on be and I'm working on becoming more secure. So just chiming in here. Dismissive avoidant attachment style is the sort of attachment style where you learned early in life that you can't really depend on other people. And so you avoid relationships and you avoid being vulnerable and you avoid attachment insecurity by just keeping people at bay. You put up walls, that kind of thing. So upper tier patron Jasmine from Oregon. She says that she's the dismissive avoidant attachment style. Going on to her email. I am soon to be married and my fiance has a preoccupied style. So preoccupied style, chiming in here, a preoccupied style is where you're very preoccupied with your spouse. You're very worried about losing them. Going back to the email. 
He is very insecure about me leaving him or cheating on him. It makes sense because in his last serious relationship, he was cheated on. Also, he never met his father. His mother passed away when he went through, and he went through foster care. He has a lot of abandonment in his life. Okay, just chiming in here. So, uh, some details about the fiance is he never met his father. His mother died when he was young, and then he went into foster care. So, even though the mo- the mom didn't purposely abandon him, the you know the universe taught him that people can abandon him. So there's that. And then his last serious relationship, he was cheated on. And so this is trauma. This is relational trauma that can result in attachment insecurity. And one of the ways to cope with attachment insecurity is to, be, is to become preoccupied, clingy, desperate, demanding, um, hypervigilant is a good word. Okay, let's go on with the email. He asks me frequently if I will leave or cheat on him, and I offer him reassurance that I will not. In the past, this type of behavior would have annoyed me and drove me away. But I really love him, so I am turning to compassion and understanding, and understanding that it's just a lot of fear that he is feeling inside. Okay, just chiming in here. She's saying that he frequently asks, are you going to leave me? Are you going to cheat on me? And she, in the past, would have been like, this is annoying. I don't want to be with this person he's clingy, he is insecure, I don't want to be with him. But instead, she really, you know, because she really loves him, she's like, okay, I'm in it to win it. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to dedicate myself to reassuring him. And that's great. I mean, if that's, that's, that's usually the way to go. All right, going on with the email here. I want to help him feel secure, but I am not willing to let this turn into controlling behavior. So um, just chiming in here. So I don't know what upper tier patron Jasmine is experiencing, but uh, sometimes preoccupied tactics can become controlling, meaning that the preoccupied person will say, you can't have friends or you can't stay with, you can't go out with your friends after work or um, I need to see your phone all the time, you know, just jealousy essentially. And so she's worried. She's like, well, I want him to feel secure, um, but, you know, I I don't want to give in so much that he just learns that he can just control my life all the time. You know, I'm willing to reassure him, but I, I feel like it's kind of edging into him being controlling and me not having power over my life. Uh, email goes on here. I don't want to have to check in with him all the time. And I don't want to have to refrain from spending time with my friends just to ease his anxiety, etc. Could you offer tips on how to help someone feel more secure without compromising your own boundaries? End of email. So it's a great email. Uh, upper tier patron Jasmine from Oregon. Either you're a very smart person and or you listen to this podcast a lot and we talk about attachment. It's just music to my ears. You know, <laughs> years ago, I, I, the sort of emails I would get would not be so informed, I'll say. So I I know I'm already working with someone with a a great deal of emotional awareness. And my cat wants something out of my office, so I'm going to let her out. (laughs) All right. So advice to you, Jasmine. Well, so obviously going to therapy, going to couples therapy will really help with going to like an EFT, emotionally focused couples therapist or an attachment-based couples therapist will really help because they will be able to speak directly to the issues that you're talking about. So that's really the best way. And I can't emphasize this enough. Um, I feel like 90% of couples should probably be in therapy at least once a month. Not every couples therapist will allow that, um, but many couples do, including me. I have couples that I see once a month or once every two months because, and 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 they'll be in therapy with me for years and years. <laughs> So, uh, so if you can find a therapist to do that, it could be, you know, pretty cheap. It's like just one session every month and it can go a long way, believe me, to address the issues that you're talking about, if not other issues. Now, sometimes you need more therapy per, per month, but anyway, uh, so go to therapy, but tips, other kinds of things that you could do in therapy, specific things are keep doing what you're doing. Uh, and develop a language between the two of you around his attachment insecurities and yours. 
that for him, when he gets worried, he wants to, he, he gets hypervigilant, which means that, and his anxiety is very high. So he's freaking out, in a, a colloquial way of putting it. And when you're freaking out and hypervigilant, then you're not so, you don't really care that much about doing things in a diplomatic way. And so you might make a lot of demands and you might be controlling because you're freaking out. And for you, Jasmine, you haven't talked about this, but I'm guessing that when things are a little tense at home, you probably want to stay out more. And for the dismissive person, often they will be unaware of this process. Sometimes they're aware of it, but so let's say you get into a fight and you're just like, oh, you know, there he goes again with blah, blah, blah. One of the first thoughts that will enter a dismissive or a um, avoidant avoiding attached person is, I got to get out of the house. I got to hang out with my friends. I've got to go on a hike by myself. I've got to go golfing by myself, or I'm going to stay longer at work because I don't want to, because that's the avoidant, right? It's like, I don't like what's happening with my spouse. I'm going to avoid it and I'm going to do something else. And uh, I need a break from this person. Well, there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but sometimes it can be used as a passive aggression, meaning that you're really upset at your spouse. And as a way of communicating that, you're just going to avoid staying home. You're going to give the cold shoulder. You're going to give the the frowny face, the the resting, I'm upset face. And by doing that, that obviously is really going to be triggering to the other person. So the the thing that I'll often say is to dismissive avoidant um, people, underneath their dismissiveness and their walls is a preoccupied person. It just looks differently. Every Everyone who is insecure is preoccupied, but dismissive people hide it and preoccupied people don't. So uh, you are also, Jasmine, probably having a lot of uh, communication that is problematic and could be better dealt with with more upfront vulnerability. I don't know that, obviously. So that can help. But uh, oh, But overall, the two of you having a language around this, like for example, and maybe you already have this, but let's say that he, you notice that he's starting to say things like, well, what are you, what are you doing? Uh, you were late, you know, from work or how come you didn't answer my texts yesterday? Well, you know, what, what's going on? Okay. So instead of dealing with the surface level of like, well, why are you asking me about my texts? Or you need to calm down or, you know, have a language around it. If the two of you develop on it as a team, a language, so that one or both of you can say, oh, okay. So it sounds like you're having some preoccupied fears right now. You're having some attachment, hypervigilance, or whatever language you have around it. Not as a way of pathologizing him or a, a way of discounting him, but a, but a way of labeling it so that you very quickly as a couple understand what's happening. And then, so so if you have that language, he can say like, yeah, 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 uh, that's what's happening. And then he better understands what's happening rather than falling into the notions that the relationship is about to end. And so he can sort of put it in perspective like, oh, yeah, I'm having a preoccupied, hypervigilant moment right now. That's what's happening. Um, or you can, sometimes people will name it something like say his real name is Jeff, but when he is preoccupied and hypervigilant, you call him Scotty or something, <laughs> or I don't know. You just have a different name. Oh, it sounds like it sounds like uh, scared Jeff is coming out, or so. You know, you can talk about that again. You you collaboratively build this, and I'll do this with couples so that it doesn't feel pathologizing or dismissing to the preoccupied person. So you label it, and you talk about it, and then th- uh, you have this routine around how to address it. So one, you're putting in perspective for both people. So you, and you sort of name it rather than just dealing with the surface conflict. It's like there's a much broader uh, foundation to what's happening right now than just whether or not I texted you back. And there's a bigger emotional scenario here that we have to talk about or acknowledge. And so, so you, you're able to acknowledge it. And then you just have a routine of reassuring. So you're just like, so I just, at, instead of getting an argument about texting and about freedom and about the fact that you didn't see your phone or your phone turned off or whatever it was, you can be like, I, it looks like hypervigilant Scotty is coming out right now. And I just want to tell you that regardless of me texting you back, I love you. 
I'm not cheating on you. I was at work uh, with these people. I, I have no romantic feelings towards them at all. You're the only one for me. Um, blah, blah, blah. Let's hug. You know, maybe we've gotten a little distant this week. Let's have date night tonight or whatever it is. Okay. So you're going, so you label it and you're going right to the heart of the matter and you're not fighting about the silliness of whether or not you texted him back or not. But that requires you to be able, as a avoidant person, to be able to handle vulnerability and to handle um, emotional outlay, if you will. And so, you know, that's hard. But you have your label too. Like you have normal Jasmine and then you have like uh, avoidant Annie. <laughs> so preoccupied Pete and avoidant Annie. And when you're, you're just, and so he might go, oh, I'm getting a bit of avoidant Annie from you right now. And you can be like, oh, okay. If he's seeing avoidant Annie in me, then it probably is happening because he, he's the first to notice it as I am. And that's triggering his pre preoccupied Pete. And then he's getting hypervigilant about the text, but that's not really, really what's going on. What's really going on is that he's terrified he's going to lose me. And of course, he's not going to lose me. And so I have to um, drum up my feelings from the inside and not avoid it and not run away, but actually lean in, all those kinds of things. So I hope that that answers your question, upper tier patron Jasmine from Oregon. All right. Well, that does it for that episode. I, you know, whenever I sit down to read emails, I'm like, because right now I have 47 pages of emails that I have copied <laughs> into a Word document. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to get to like, what, like 10 pages? I got to like one page of questions because <laughs> I always end up talking for a lot longer than I think I'm going to. And we're at the end of the hour. So, um, Tune in next time when I continue with this ever building, you know, because the other thing is in the intervening days that I record another episode of email episodes, another hundred people will email me. <laughs> so, so anyway, but I love your emails and I, they're great questions. And like Jasmine exhibited here is just a wonderful self-awareness and learning of attachment and effort to make her life better. And uh, so it's, it's just, it's great to see. It's great to see such wisdom and love and care and depth to people's thinking. You know, you look on the internet, you just think, ah, everyone's an a-hole and no one cares about anybody. But I get a lot of emails and it's clear. People care. People are trying. People are loving. People are scared. People want to do the right thing. And uh, it's very, um, um, what shall I say? It's very invigorating. It's very, makes me very optimistic about the human race. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.